Some of my most popular videos on the channel are my history videos. The most popular video I've ever done is one that I've done recently on the history of the TRS-80. That video has over 268,000 views as of the time that I'm sitting here recording this, which is amazing to me. Other popular videos include my Atari history series and the video I did on the Apple One. I'm also working on a few more videos that contain a lot of history in them, and I know that I would not have been able to make any of those videos without people archiving documents, articles, magazines, and all sorts of other historical documents and things that were relevant about those systems at the time. So while I'm working on those history videos, I thought it might be nice to stop and show people just how easy it is now to archive historical documents, magazines, manuals, all those kinds of other things. So today I'm going to be showing you three easy ways that you can start to archive your documents too. Scan them in and preserve them for future generations. It's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. Well, hey everybody, welcome back to the Retro Hack Shack. My name's Aaron and thanks for joining me today where we're going to be talking about how easy it has become to digitally archive and preserve uh, manuals, documents, photos, and all kinds of other things uh, that you might want to back up and preserve for others to see in the future. I think all of us in the community have benefited from others who have taken the time to digitize magazines, photos, whatever the case may be, and actually get those things online for the rest of us to enjoy and relive some of that nostalgia from our, from our youth or perhaps even be able to research some card that I might find at eWaste, for example. And you might find these materials on archive.org or other sites like the RetroWeb who are doing a great job archiving and preserving information about motherboards and other components, including manuals and jumper settings and things like that, which can be really difficult to find. So just how easy has it become to actually take digital scans of some of these things and get them up, get them up online? Well, I'm going to show you three ways to do that. The first way is actually just using your phone. It seems pretty simple, but it's become a lot better than it used to be. You'd be surprised how easy it is. The second is through a multifunction device that may have a scanner on it or a dedicated uh, bed scanner that people still have around. I'm going to show you one that I really like to carry with me because it's nice and portable. And finally, for those bulky materials like books and magazines that are really hard to digitize, I'm going to show you a way that you can actually get those types of documents scanned in, fixed up, and then uploaded to your favorite preservation site. Now, before we get started, I do want to just put out a disclaimer that I'm not a lawyer, and then copyright issues can be tricky. So if you want to do this type of work, either as a form of free use or as a form of fan preservation, which is kind of a new area that's really sprung up in the last 10 years or so, uh, you do so at your own risk. Okay, so let's talk about the first way to digitize documents and things like that, and that is, of course, with with your phone. Now, as recent as a few years ago, I wouldn't have recommended the phone as a backup device or as a digitizing device. And that's because even though the cameras were getting better, they weren't quite that good yet that you could do things like really reliable OCR. Maybe the images might be a little blurry. Maybe they would be out of focus. But in the last few years, the cameras on these phones and the software that runs those cameras has gotten a lot better. Let me give you a quick example of using the phone to archive a document. So to start with, you're going to need a phone from the past three years or so. I'm a Google Pixel user myself, so anything from a Pixel 6, Pixel 7, or the new Pixel 8, or probably anything after that should work just fine. If you're an iPhone user, or Samsung user, or some other cell phone user, just get something that has a really good quality camera in it. Next, you're going to need some software. You can use Adobe Scan, Microsoft Lens, or what I'm going to be using today, Cam Scanner. I've been using Cam Scanner for years to scan in my expenses to submit on my expense reports for business trips. 
It does a great job of scanning in receipts like this Rayleigh's receipt here from the other day, and it will automatically crop to the detected edges of the document, and you can select for it to transfer the image from a photo into black and white, which makes it super readable and cuts down on the file size. It also will automatically correct the aspect ratio if you happen to be scanning at an angle, and it does really well with images too. Here's the cover of a US Robotics manual. You can see it's blue, and when I scan this in, it comes out pretty well. I also have this Kovacs Voice Master that I want to feature on the channel at some point. It looks to be a prototype board, but this came with a full set of manuals and cards. And as I scan these in, it does really well at transferring these faded, but essentially black and white images and manuals into something that's much more readable, especially if you were to upload this to an archiving site for someone to take a look at later who might not have this documentation available to them. Now, if you're using a phone like I am with a macro mode, then there's an added benefit in using your phone, which is that you can easily look up, uh, for example, markings on chips that may be too hard to read if you have old eyes like I do. And with the magnification available, you can actually do a decent job of tracing uh, traces on PCBs to see if they're broken. I know I've been using my phone in my repair work more and more over the years, and it's become an invaluable tool for me at my bench. Now, the next way you can archive things fairly easily is through some sort of a flatbed scanner. So you may have one of these in a multifunction device, and those types of scanners can actually be really helpful and make your life easier if they have some sort of auto-feeding mechanism, and if the things that you're scanning don't have staples or splines on them, like magazines might, but if they're just a bunch of eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, or obviously it's gonna be different around the world, maybe it's different where you live, the standard paper size, uh, you can actually put a bunch of those in the scanner at one time, hit scan, and it'll do a pretty good job at high quality of turning those pages into digital images that then you can take and either edit or run OCR on, optical character recognition, or just take them, put them into a PDF and upload those to archive.org or your favorite preservation site. Dedicated flatbed scanners are also still an option. And I have a favorite one that I use for a very particular use case. It's this Canon LIDE30 uh, flatbed scanner. It's very small, it's very portable. It connects via USB and you don't need to carry a power brick with you. And I actually sometimes carry this around in my backpack if I'm visiting family or relatives. And that's because this particular scanner does really well with glossy photos. I don't know if you remember those photos from the 80s that had that texture on it. And the problem with those is that the, when you try to scan those with a modern scanner, the light reflects off them and you get a horrible scan of those particular photos. But with this particular scanner, because of the way it operates, it actually does a wonderful job of glossy photo scanning. So if you have some glossy photos, you might wanna take a look and see if you can get one of these on eBay. It's very light and easy to store. And I've been using this for about, oh, 20 years or so now, I think. And uh, it's always done a great job. It's lasted a long time. And it's great to be able to pull this out and use it for those glossy photos that you might need to archive. However, both the phone and flatbed scanners have one big drawback. And that's when it comes to trying to scan in a book or a magazine, or even a manual like this. This is stapled. You could take the staples out of it, I suppose, but trying to get this 100% uh, flat on a flatbed scanner or trying to take a picture with your phone isn't going to be ideal, especially if you want if you have a color manual or something that you want to take really good photos of. This one is kind of, uh, you know, over the years, it has really been crimped into a certain style and it's going to be pretty hard to flatten this out to the degree that you could get it in a flatbed scanner or even get a good picture with your phone. And what's even worse is when you have something like this. This is an issue of the computer shopper from 1987. Can you imagine taking one of these and trying to get it 
flat in a flatbed scanner. This is not an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It is much bigger than that. And so trying to get a good quality digital image of something like this is really going to be a problem. Now, previously, if you wanted to scan in a book or a magazine like that, you could send it away to a professional scanning service, which was very expensive, uh, or you would have to buy a very expensive scanner to be able to make good quality digital scans of those materials. However, with this product, this is the Scissor ET24 Pro Scanner, now there is an inexpensive or relatively inexpensive way to be able to scan in books, magazines, and really anything else that you might want to scan. So for the rest of the video, I'm going to be taking a look at this product and see how easy it is to use and what kind of quality scans we can get out of it. And if you notice, this is why I marked the video as paid promotion. I'm not doing a paid sponsorship or a paid review for this particular product, but they did send it to me for free. I'm going to be giving you my own opinions on it, good or bad, it doesn't matter. But because they sent me a free product to take a look at, I want to be upfront about that. Let's go ahead and do a quick unboxing of this scissor product. And as you can see, things are nicely laid out. You've got some uh, software. There's kind of a remote button here. Everything is labeled power adapter, foot pedal, foot pedal. That'll be nice for if you have to use your hands and you want to take a picture or something like that. Having a foot pedal will be nice. USB cable and finger cots for book scanning. So just to show that there's also this black mat and the side lights. Just take everything out and then you can reach in and take this out. There we go. Surprisingly light, very rigid, and it looks like we've got some peeling to do, so cue the music. You can see on the underside we have the camera itself as well as an array of LEDs here to illuminate the uh, subject that you are going to scan. There's also some ports back here. Some sensors back here. On the back, we have this connection for the lights. Looks like brightness, zoom controls, and a manual picture button. And then on the back, of course, we've got on and off, power, USB uh, cable connection. There's one for the button or the foot pedal, and then there's an HDMI output as well. I didn't have time to show this in the video, but that HDMI out can actually be used to connect this to a display or a projector to use in classrooms to project whatever is under the scanner to the rest of the room. Now it was time to get everything set up, so I rolled out the black mat, aligned the scanner with the little cutout on the mat, and all of the connections plugged in easily where you would expect them to go. I downloaded the software from the website, and there's a serial number on the bottom of the unit that you have to use to activate the software. Now, this interface may look a little bit overwhelming at first until you realize that all of these controls on the side are for batch operations. If you wanted to crop everything to a certain size, for example, you can do that to multiple images at a time. There's an exporter function down here where you can export in multiple functions. And then down at the bottom, there are uh, little tools you can use to manipulate each individual image if you want to. As you can see, I'm using my tablet for this, which just was really handy to do because I could set it up here on the table and uh, just click on the buttons instead of having a keyboard to get in the way. You'll also notice the real-time edge detection as I'm moving my fingers in and out and putting materials in and out of the viewfinder here. You can see that it's detecting the edges and letting you know where it thinks it's going to crop the image to. And I did some similar scans as I did on the other devices and I can show those to you now. I also messed a bit with my overhead lighting because it is rather bright. I ended up turning the overhead lighting off in the garage, but I kept my side fill lighting on. And I also played around with using the top light on the device as well as the backlight on the device. So you'll have to mess with these and see which bit of lighting uh, actually gives you the best results. This also gave me the opportunity to play around with these finger cots, as they're called. Now, the cots that I'm familiar with are basically finger 
condoms, essentially. They go over the tips of your fingers. If you have a cut on your finger or if you're just working with things with your fingertips and you don't want to get your fingertips dirty, you can wear these things. But in this case, they're actually specially designed to pull apart the pages as you scan them. And then afterwards, automatically they get deleted from the page that you scanned and the software will try to uh, incorporate as best it can what was on the page. If it was an image or something like that, it'll try to kind of blend it in. Uh, and you might notice a little smudge, but it doesn't at least show this yellow tool that I'll be using. And I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. Okay, well, it's time to put this thing to the test. So I am going to see how quickly I can scan in this entire Computer Shopper magazine from 1987. And it's actually has some interesting things in here. Right here, it says Data Tree and Habaview, two databases for the Atari ST. So, you know, it's not just about computer parts. They actually did have some interesting articles in Computer Shopper. So I want to scan this whole thing in from front to back and see how long it takes. Now, one problem I've already run into in setting this up is that the the magazine is just a little bit bigger than the viewer can see. So I contacted the manufacturers of the scissor, scissor company, whatever, and they said that this machine will do an up to an A3 sheet of paper, which should be somewhere around 11 and a half by 16 and a half inches in North America measurements. So, um, yeah, let's just see how big this thing is. Oh, there's a spider going through there. Let's see how big this thing actually is. So the computer shopper is 13 inches by 20 inches. So yeah, that's definitely why it wouldn't fit. It's quite a bit bigger than the maximum size that this thing allows. So what I've done is I've actually propped this thing up appropriately enough on a top of a zoom modem. I believe it's, uh, I don't know, maybe a 14.4 zoom modem down here. So I've propped it up about an inch and I'm hoping that I can get a good enough uh, image that's automatically cropped to the, the page size, even though it goes off the little black mat a little bit or the, the viewer is now picking up some of my green background. I suppose I could put a bigger black mat down. That would probably help, but let's just see how this works. To speed things along, I am going to use the foot pedal. And the foot pedal is, you know, just what you would expect. It's got a little bit more resistance in the switch here. There's like a spring or something built in. And when you step on it, it just makes that little clicking sound. So it's a little bit more rugged because you're using your foot and it just plugs into the USB, uh, just like the uh, uh, external button that I have over here is plugged in now. And it's kind of funny because it reminds me a little bit of those chomping teeth that you used to wind up and then they would kind of, you know, go across the table or whatever. That's just how weird my mind is, I guess. But anyway, I'm going to hook this up. We'll get started. I'm going to put on some music, hit the timer, and we'll see how far I can go from front to back on this thing. And by the way, this magazine is 536, well, if you include the back, 537, 38 pages, I guess. So over 500 pages, something that uh, I, I would imagine you would never do with a flatbed scanner or a phone in this case. But because of the automation with this particular book scanner, I think this is going to go pretty darn quickly. You can also use auto mode, which I tried a little bit. What happens with auto mode, though, is sometimes it detects a new page with before you're ready to take the shot. And uh, either, you know, maybe your hands are in the way or whatever. I found that it's not 100% reliable. So that's why I'm using the foot pedal instead of auto mode. If auto mode worked reliably every single time, it definitely would be quicker. But this way I can make sure I've got the middle of the page aligned with the middle marker here on the monitor. And I can just hit it and then go to the next one and keep going like that. All right, so here we go. How fast can you scan in 500 and whatever it was, 500 plus pages of a computer shopper magazine? Here we go.
All right, well, I'm finally done and my fingers are a little bit sore. It took me one hour and 20 minutes to scan in 538 pages of this Computer Shopper magazine. And ChatGPT just told me that that works out to about six to seven uh, scans per minute. So six to seven pages scanned per minute, which, you know, isn't that bad, especially considering that I had to a lot of times stop and just slightly uh, get the magazine in the right spot because it would drift over time. So anyway, considering all of that, I don't think that's too bad, but it gives me deep admiration for people that take big magazines like this or books like this and actually scan them in by hand. It is a lot of work, but still hour and 20 minutes. It's what I do for you guys. All right, I'm gonna export this as a PDF and then we can take a closer look uh, on my computer and I'll share those images in full screen with you so you can see how the scan actually came out. Okay, well, here we are. I've got the scan on the computer. And by the way, I left almost everything at the default except when I exported the PDF. I exported it in a high quality just because it was such a big magazine. Um, the default was medium and I did high. Otherwise, everything was automatic. So I didn't do any cropping. I didn't have to like cut out the cots, those little things that you pull the pages apart with. So we'll see how we did. As you can see, this first page came out pretty good. There is a tiny reflection. Now, what I did was I turned the lights off in the garage, but this was daytime and there was a little bit of light coming through the window. So I think that's what's happening here on these first pages, which are glossy. Um, this one I used the back lights on, not the top lights, but all the other pages I used the top lights on the highest setting. So here we go. You can see again some glare, not the fault of the scanner at all, completely my fault, but this looks pretty good. And uh, I'm kind of excited to go through this later on uh, once I get done with this video because there's a lot in this particular time frame that is just so nostalgic. 1987, so much going on. You can see in here, there's obviously going to be section, big sections for IBM and Apple and Macintosh, but there's also Amiga stuff in here. There's a REST stuff in here. Uh, there's programming things in here. There's even like, you know, making your own hardware stuff, um, computers and education, Tandy, Texas Instruments. I mean, this was just like the, the perfect little slice of computer history to get all of these things in one magazine like this. Let's see if we can zoom in to the text here and just see, or even the text over here on the Compu Classics ad um, and just see, you know, how good the scan actually is. I think this was uh, set for the default is like 300 DPI. So let's zoom in and just see what some of this really small text looks like. So I would say this is actually really good quality for text this size. And of course you could do even better if you customize your settings and did a higher DPI, but this is definitely readable. Um, and I don't have any problem with this at, at all. This is actually really good quality. I'm zoomed in, I don't know, pretty far. <laughs> I don't know exactly how far I'm zoomed in. And uh, even the, where this glare is, you can still kind of make out these prices by zooming in here. So if I was doing research or something like this and came across uh, a scan like this, I would be really happy with these results. That's just my personal opinion. Looking at the text on the other side here, same thing, really good quality. If I was going to use this, in a video or something like this, you would have no problem reading this, uh, even on a cell phone, if you're watching on a cell phone. Of course, I would zoom in a bit, but since this is a PDF, you can zoom in quite far and the quality looks really good. Now, here we are on some of the non-glossy pages. Again, they look very good, very readable. If we go to the next page here, we can see that at this point, this Lyco computers were selling uh, you know, all kinds of things as many of these vendors were, right? You can see them all listed over here, but you can see they were selling the Commodore PCs. Um, actually, I'd love to find one of these. I haven't found one yet. Commodore 64, they were still selling for $149. They were selling the Atari ST. They were selling the uh, Commodore 128D here. You need to spend more money and buy a Commodore 128. So in and PCs, of course. So yeah, really uh, interesting to see these ads and how much they were charging for things. But again, the quality here, everything on the non-glossy pages, very readable, no problems. Now here's a full page color ad in the non-glossy section from Computer Products United. It looks like they were selling clones and whatnot, and they were advertising the new 
386 machines that you could get. And you can see here on the edges of this scan that the auto cropping actually uh, picked up because the spline is so thick. Even though I was pulling these pages out with those caught things, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, because the spline was so thick, it kind of uh, accordioned the pages over here and they didn't uh, crop that out. You could obviously go back and do that yourself if you wanted to, but I don't mind it for a scan of an item such as this. Now, you will see over here on this side, it looks like a little blur here. And if we zoom into that, this is where that cot was. So you can see it automatically removed the cot and did some automatic matching of to replace what would have been here. Let's take a look at another place where I was using that cot where we can see that in action. Okay, here's another one here on page 124 where you can see I had the cot I couldn't quite catch the edge because it was pretty thin. And that caught thing uh, was right here. Penny, no. But it even like used either some sort of AI or matching or something to get this black line continuous through here, which it would not have been when I had that yellow plastic thing over here. So it does a good job. It obviously can't replicate all the text that would have been underneath that thing if I get the cots thing a little bit too far into the page. But you can see it does try to at least replicate what the page would have looked like if it can. And the biggest problem I had, you would have had with, again, not because of the scanner, you would have had this with any type of scanning mechanism, is the text in this particular magazine goes right into the crease uh, where the spline is. And the scanner did a really good job of leveling out the page. The curl on these pages in the middle, even using those cots, was pretty dramatic. And because of the laser leveling that it does, the end result is pretty good here. But what ends up happening is, is just because there's no way, unless you break the spline to pull these pages out, there are some areas where it just could not see what was in the crease of some of these pages. Let me show you another one. Here we go. This is dead center in the middle of the magazine, and it was impossible for me, like I said, to get these pages pulled apart at, at, at all um, because the magazine, the book is just so thick. And you can see here in the middle of the two pages, it's done as good as it can to get the text, you know, represented in a in a good way in the scan, but it just can't do it because it can't, you know, fix it something that it can't see. Here's an interesting one. I was trying to capture these uh cards that were in all of these magazines that you could rip off and send in for more information this one somebody's ripped off this top section of it but i wanted to get uh, because this was right in the middle i wanted to get a good scan of this page and then i moved this over so i could get a good scan of this page but you can see it really didn't know how the laser didn't know how to handle the correction because of this little like, insert tear out thing that it was on here but if we go to the next page you can see now i've got a good scan of this one so what i could do i would probably just delete this page and then delete this page and then you'd have a conti nice continuous scan going on here at this point in the scan uh because i had to correct that middle line that goes down between these pages so much uh, and go back and forth almost on every page turn i realized that the magazine itself had been slipping down almost out of frame here and you can see some of it's cut off on the bottom and so uh, shortly after this i moved it back up to the top but what happened was uh, as i was scanning this i ended up it ended up automatically picking up a little bit more information and creating a bigger image here uh, because the magazine had slid down so much if we go a little bit later on you can see when it can get a few, full view of uh, all the edges it does a really good job at cropping but when it doesn't you end up with things like this and again you could go back and fix this manually if you wanted to all in all i will i would say that i saved a lot of time by using the device the scans are decent and good and if i put a little bit more effort into it i could make them even better if i wanted to but for a first time doing this kind of thing i would say the results are very good so at this point you might be asking yourself well what's the real difference is this scanner we've been talking about worth it or should i just use my phone well, let me show you a couple of pictures that I took that will make the difference clear. Here's a picture I took from my phone using the same amount of light and from the same distance as the scanner. And here's the one I took from the scanner itself. You can clearly see if I put these side by side that the difference is dramatic when using this scanner versus using your phone. Even though the phone does an adequate job, it just doesn't match up. 
Another great use I found for this scanner was actually scanning in images of motherboards and other electronic devices, anything that's relatively flat. You can see these pictures of motherboards that I took turned out really well. The markings on the ICs, while not perfect, is definitely legible, and these images would be wonderful to upload to the retroweb.com. So which device should you use? Well, this isn't a shootout of over which one is best and which one is worst. It's actually just showing you different ways that you can scan images in. If you have a recent cell phone, like I have a Pixel 7 Pro, which has a decent camera on it, and you're scanning in things that are either graphical or kind of uh, on the small side, then you can use an app on your phone to do auto cropping, autofocus, all those kinds of things, and get a pretty decent result. And that would be for something that maybe you're only scanning in occasionally, one, one page, two pages. If you need to scan in something that's very glossy, I would highly recommend getting an LIDE scanner or using the flatbed scanner that you might have on a multifunction printing device. Also, if you need to feed in multiple sheets of paper that will fit in that device and you happen to have a sheet feeder that you can use, that is certainly going to be a great option to scan in a lot of documents or pages very quickly. However, for things that are bound or have staples in them or things that you can't put through a feeder, this device makes it quick and easy to scan. As I showed, a 500 page thick magazine and get really good high quality results. Now you can order the Scissor ET24 Pro on Amazon for around $650, which really isn't that bad when you compare it to some of the professional book scanners that I showed earlier in the video. However, I reached out to Scissor and they gave me a link that you can use to go directly to their shop and save even more money and They've also offered a discount code AC15. So when you go to that link, which is in the description below, and enter the code AC15, you'll get an additional 15% off your order. So thank you for Scissor for making this device even more affordable for the community to use to archive their documents. Well, there you have it. Three ways that you can get started archiving documents and photos and all kinds of other things. And you really should by scanning these things, sending them up to archive.org. You're really doing the community a great service. And I, for one, appreciate all of you that have either scanned or uploaded documents about motherboards or hardware or technology or software. I have definitely benefited. So keep up the good work on archiving this stuff so that everybody can get that information. If you want to see what I discover at eWaste every week, or you want to watch me repair particular computers or equipment that may not be featured on the main channel, make sure you head over to my second channel, that's Retro Hack Shack After Hours, and subscribe to that one as well, because I'm dividing my content over two channels, and I know a lot of you are interested in tech repair and things like that. So head over there and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. I'm going to put a video up here for you to watch next on this channel, though. So go ahead and click on that one, and I'll see you in that one next. End of line.